Okay. I think we're ready to start, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. I'm apologizing uh, for wearing a mask. I had a bit of a flu this week, and I was worried that I um, would contaminate everyone. Um, but I didn't want to leave uh, Lizelle in the, you know, at such a late stage uh, not coming. So um, that's the reason for the mask. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, at this inaugural lecture. Uh, we've done quite a few this year, but it remains a highlight. Uh, every talk has been interesting, informative, um, and I'm sure that we'll have the same talk this evening uh, in terms of interest and, and relevance. Um, it is really the highlight of a professor's or an academic's career to uh, stand in front of an audience and deliver an inaugural lecture. Uh, it, is a, it is a great honor, um, and I ask that we all celebrate this uh, with Luzelle. As Stephen, I see that you're here. Uh, Stephen did this a few weeks ago, um, so he knows exactly what it's all about. And it is quite an honor, Stephen, am I right? Yeah, it's great. So thank you, everyone, for being here and sharing this special moment with Luzelle. I'd like to welcome the Vice Rector, Institutional Change, Strategic Partnerships and Societal Impact, Dr. Malapu Kubela. Uh, I saw him outside. Is he here? There he is. Malapu, welcome to you. Then I'd like to welcome the Dean of the Faculty of the Humanities, Professor Heidi Hudson, who's joined me in the, in the front of the stage uh, this, this evening. I'd also like to welcome the Vice Dean of the Humanities, Professor Chicha Twala, um, and I also saw him earlier. He's sitting there at the back. Uh, Chita hasn't learned to sit in front of the class. Uh, so still at the back, Chita. <laughs> then I'd like to welcome the head of department, Dr. Edwin Duplessis. Um, Edwin, this is also your second time in, in quite a short period. Um, and I'm really proud that the department is making such progress with so many inaugural lectures. I think that says something about the department. Um, and congratulations to you as head of the department. Uh, then I'd like to welcome, of course, the, the lady of the day, the lady of the evening, Professor Luzelle Nudia. Uh, Luzelle, I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, Luzelle started out, you know, when we st were still fighting for her for a rating, so I've walked quite a, quite a way with her um, in her academic career, um, and it really feels like my own inaugural lecture this evening. So, Luzelle, congratulations, and it's been fun <laughs> taking this journey with you. Then I'd like to welcome um, Johan Kulain, who is Professor Nudia's partner. Uh, Johan, where are you? There's Johan. Johan, nice to meet you. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the university, and I hope that you'll enjoy the talk. Uh, then I'd like to welcome every, all the friends, everyone from outside the university who's here this evening. Thank you for joining um, us. I'd like to welcome the, the staff of the UFS. I see some staff members in front here. Um, and then I'd like to welcome all the students. Um, so thank you for joining this evening with us. Uh, and I think there's some of you sitting around here. So welcome to you. Uh, then I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining online. Um, and then it's really just up to me to ask Professor Hudson to introduce Luzelle this evening, uh, and then for everyone to enjoy this talk with us. Thank you very much. Heidi, I'll move away from you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll just sit here. Sorry, I'm social distancing. Well, I think we should also welcome you, Professor Latoon. <laughs> <laughs> you never get a chance to welcome yourself. So um, thank you very much for those um, opening words. And thank you for supporting the research that is being done in this faculty. And I think that tonight's event is also um, the culmination of a lot of research and a lot of support behind the scenes. And we're really grateful for that. And I'm tempted to say who's doing, doing the lecture next week because it seems to be every week. And most of the time it is the psychology department. We must remember a few years ago it was Professor Karl Esterheiser and then Professor Fushia. So it's a whole, whole string of them. Uh, we should actually put them all together in one room and make them speak again. Um, okay, now that was a bad idea. So <laughs> colleagues, let me, let me start with the formalities. And it's a great honor and a pleasure. And Luzelle, you're going to have to stand up for a little while. 
so that I can introduce you properly. It's a huge honor to introduce Professor Luzelle Nordia to you. She's no stranger to the colleagues here at the Free State University, but on this auspicious occasion, we also need to hear it again. Um, and we are going to listen to her talk on In Search of Self, Emerging Adults as Actors, Agents, and Authors. Now, Luzelle obtained her PhD degree in 2008 specialization in psychology at the University of the Free State. The master's degree in social science, cum laude, in 1997, specializing in counseling psychology. The honors degree, Bachelor of Social Sciences, cum laude, it's be beginning to form a pattern, as you can see, 1995, also from the Free State University. And then the undergraduate B. Sci degree in 1994. Luzal is a professor in the Department of, uh, Department of Psychology at the University of uh, the Free State and a registered counsel, counseling and research psychologist. She holds an NRF C2 rating and serves on the editorial boards of the journal Emerging Adulthood and Identity as well, and collaborates in research projects with colleagues from across the world, Africa, Europe, and the USA. She published approximately 50 peer-reviewed articles and delivered more than 70 papers at national and international conferences. She enjoys teaching at postgraduate level in the areas of psychotherapeutic approaches, ethics, and applied research, and often supervises the research of masters and doctoral students. And I think that Luzelle is probably one of the most productive postgraduate supervisors that the faculty has ever seen. 40 completed master's student studies and eight PhDs. It's, it's a fantastic record. And she's also one of the stalwarts in our postgraduate and research webinars that we've been running for the last two years. We've gone back to Luzelle asking her to talk again about the do's and don'ts of research supervision. And I, I can tell you, colleagues, the wisdom and the techniques is something that we don't often find in a, uh, in a colleague. So thank you very much for that, for doing that for the faculty. Her scholarship is focused on the challenges of forming an integrated identity in contexts of change and transition, with an appreciation for the multicultural milieu in which South African adolescents and emerging adults live and learn. In 2022, this year, she received also an interdisciplinary research grant from the university, and we look forward to see that research come to fruition. Last week, um, Luzelle mentioned to me that she would much rather, much rather stay in her office and do her work quietly than do the lecture. But life is not that simple. <laughs> life is not supposed to be easy. So here we go. We, we really look forward to your lecture. And I want to also say from my side, congratulations. It's a milestone, and we are very proud of you. Thank you, Luzelle. Thank you very much, Professor Hudson, and good evening to everybody. I would like to start tonight with a few acknowledgements. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the University of the Free State as an institution that has been my academic home, first as an undergraduate student, later as a postgraduate student, and for the last nearly two decades also as an academic. As I stand here tonight, I know that my academic identity is intricately related to this institution. I would also like to thank tonight the members of the Rectorate and the Deanery that is here, Dr. Cabela, Professor Vatun, Professor Hudson, Professor Twala, and also the Head of the Psychology Department, Dr. Duplessis. I want to acknowledge the academic community, my colleagues, students, and research assistants that has always supported me in my research endeavors, and also my family and friends, and Johan, who is here tonight, my partner, <laughs> who is always on my side, 
who always makes space for my laptop, and who's willing to have endless conversations with me about correlation and causality and reality and meaning making in a post-truth society. I would then also like to thank the event coordinators, the photographer and the technical support, and also you as the audience who's joining us tonight in person or virtually. So when I received the invitation to deliver a public lecture on the research of my academic career, I had to think carefully how to approach this task. And on reflection, I realized that research has actually given me the opportunity to put my interest in human development into scholarship. As a psychologist, I've always been interested in this question, who am I, and how people endeavor to answer this. And in my research, I've also focused on the challenges of forming an integrated identity, especially the transformational journeys of the youth, and how they balance learning in and beyond the classroom with living. So in my lecture tonight, I would like to talk to you about my research journey, what informed and shaped my research. I want to give a quick overview of some research activities and then also talk about the road ahead. This is a road that I haven't walked alone. Over the years, many masters and PhD students have walked the road with me and searched for answers around identity. And many of these research products would also be presented here tonight. In addition to that, my colleagues from the University of the Free State has published with me in the audience tonight, I see Professor Esterheiser, Mrs. Krier, Dr. Nell, Dr. Berg, Dr. Jordan, and all of them has contributed to what I present tonight. So in the field of identity research, there's this technique which is called the 20 statement test. And it asks of participants to complete the I am statement as many times as possible in a limited amount of time. And although this sounds easy, it is quite intriguing to think what signifiers will I use to describe myself to the world? Here is an example uh, from research participants in one of my studies with a word cloud of the words that they've used to describe themselves. And we can he see here the diversity of decisions we make when we want to present ourselves to the world. So to put all of this into context, identity scholars have focused on research around the identity domains or dimensions. And this boils down to placing ourselves on that continuum between sameness and difference. Where do we find association and belonging? And with which groups do we find solidarity on the one hand? Versus how do we claim our uniqueness and our difference on the other hand? So Ericsson, I've included him especially for the master students in the audience, he introduced this field of research by talking about ideological and interpersonal dimensions of identity. And through the re years, researchers have focused on aspects of social identity, such as our gender or our racial identity, also how we internalize roles, like our academic roles or our family roles, into our identity, as well as some idiosyncratic features. So from a new Ericksonian perspective, identity can be defined as a relatively stable sense of self with multiple intersecting domains that are fluid across time and context. From an African perspective, this relates to the ontological notion of personhood, which is a function of both the physical and the spiritual, the internal and the external, tradition and modernity, while positioning the self within the collective. Another strand of research is about identity development and the processes uh, through which we move in life. And this time, it's about placing ourselves, on the one hand, into a space of constancy, what makes us the same, how we stay the same over life spans, and on the other hand, how we change, how we grow and how we develop over time. Marcia introduced this uh, piece of research by talking about how we explore various identity dimensions and alternatives, and how we then later commit to what we find most valuable. And in contemporary process-orientated models, today, 
we would regard identity development as that complex unfolding of reciprocally moving between exploring and committing, sometimes in depth, sometimes in breadth, sometimes reconsidering until we identify with final commitments. From an African perspective, this relates to the normative aspects of personhood, the means of achieving personhood, how we become a person beyond just a human being. One of the more recent fields in identity study is a narrative identity framework. That's also the framework I'm going to use tonight. And here it is emphasized that identity is a person's internalized and evolving life story. This life story has a temporal dimension to it. We integrate our past, our present, and our future. It also has a contextual dimension to it, as context kind of acts as a co-creator of our stories. It sets the agenda for the type of story we can tell. And then it also has an agentic dimension. We create ourselves through our stories. And we choose to tell and retell our stories in order to find unity and purpose in life. So every story has a setting, it has some characters, it has a plot with a beginning, a middle and an end, and it has some events, some high and some low points. The setting for my research story, the theoretical context, is at the intersection between two disciplinary fields that I've always found interesting. On the one hand, there's developmental psychology, how we change over time, a lifespan perspective from conception or even before until death or even after that. Secondly, there's also cultural or social psychology, which emphasizes our ecocultural embeddedness and how we are nested in various contexts. The characters of my story, the research participants, are the young people of South Africa. Former President Nelson Mandela said, this generation of youth stands at the borderline between a past of oppression and a future of prosperity. And it is in this present in South Africa of dramatic social change that young people are trying to tell these stories and to forge a sense of self. The plot of my research unfolds through mixed methods approaches. I've always preferred a both and rather than an either op or option. And because of that, I always try to combine or balance both quantitative and qualitative procedures in order to find some breadth and some depth in understanding identity. The events of my research story will be unpacked tonight in seven chapters. And although I'm presenting them in quite a linear fashion, as if they are moving from past to present to future, they are a bit more cyclical or recursive in nature, and I'm sp I've spiraled forward and backward between the chapters. The story starts with chapter one. As an early career academic, and when I embarked on my PhD studies, I was asking myself, what does it mean to be a scholar? I was thinking about Shakespeare, who talked about the world is but a stage. And I thought about how higher education is a stage, with students and academics acting on the stage. My research at that stage was done in a higher education context, where there was many discourses about the need for transformation in higher education. And there was also much talk about the changing architecture of education, how we can learn without walls in community settings and in online environments. At that stage of my career, I was inspired by the seminal work of Boyer, who spoke about the scholarship of engagement, of Dewey, who explained how we learn in the process of living, and Freire with his pedagogy of the oppressed. And for my research, I asked, how does higher education prepare students for life? I was interested in the promise of community-engaged service learning. How learning experiences in real-world settings where students participate in activities in a community can help them to make the link between the discipline and societal dynamics and hopefully also achieve personal growth. So for my PhD, I embarked on a quantitative investigation, and I wanted to determine the effect of guided reflection activities on the development of service learning students. 
I conducted an experiment where I randomly assigned students to three different groups and exposed them to different forms of reflection. And I then conducted pre- and post-test surveys to determine the development that happened over time. And what I found with regard to the role of service learning is that over and above the academic gains, students also showed significantly higher levels of psychosocial competence towards the end of a learning experience, which means they grew with regard to self-esteem, feelings of competence, and the universal orientation. More importantly, however, is the role of reflection and how that facilitates this learning. And I found that by reflecting in groups, is of significantly more value than reflecting alone or not at all. So these findings then culminated into my PhD, which was later on reconfigured into publications with the HEQC and the CHE. We also published on intergroup psychology and the importance of cultural sensitivity. And we followed the research up with projects on student reflection, and the power of engagement when we make use of online service learning. And through all of this research, I became convinced of the value of learning beyond the classroom. This helps us to teach in a responsive way, to develop graduate attributes, and to also increase our critical awareness of the world in order to participate responsibly in the lives of others. I was also reminded of the fact that le learning is about being and relating and acting, and that we are most effective in our learning endeavors if we are active and interactive and reflective. This aligns with the tenets of experiential learning philosophies, social constructivist approaches, and connected knowing epistemologies. With this knowledge, I move on to chapter two, where I ask myself how these principles can be applied in the teaching of future psychologists. So this time around, I embarked on a qualitative exploration. And rather than just determining change at the beginning and the end of a module, I was interested in the learning experiences during a, um, a psychology module. I um, made use of five cohort groups of psychology students over a time span of five years, and I analyzed their reflection reports, triangulated with focus groups and summative portfolios in order to map the learning experience. And this is what I found. If we are confronted with new situations and new information, we often start at a place of dissonance, a kind of forked road situation, where we become aware of complexity, but we still show a resistance to take the first step. In time, because we want to regain balance and equanimity in our lives, we move beyond this dissonance. In Piagetian terms, we assimilate new information to our existing schemas, but we also accommodate by replacing existing schemas with more relevant schemas. This then sets the way for active adapting. This can happen on communicative level through understanding and meaning making, on instrumental level through practical learning, and on transformational level, which is about perspective change. This sets the way for forming new connections with knowledge systems and also with others. And this makes it possible to make commitments for the future, to have the courage and make the mindful choice to act. So in summary, this transformative learning process is like a spiral staircase where we move through certain intellectual shifts, questioning our knowledge, emotional shifts with deepened emotional realizations into action with the commitment to participate in society. We continued the exploration into psychology students' uh, uh, attitudes, firstly. We also looked at the multicultural competence development. We integrated aspects about self-regulation abilities. And we also investigated how students change if they are tasked to parent a virtual child in a developmental psychology class. And from all of this, we learned about the importance of meaning making in the psychology profession. Psychologists and psychology students 
are often confronted with complex challenges, with moral questions, and with um, ambiguous ethical situations. They also need to navigate diverse worldviews. And to do this, they need to find their own value system and a strong, spirit, strong spiritual identity. The development of this worldview or identity will happen on an epistemological level, where students ask, how do I know? But also on an intrapersonal level, the who am I question, and an interpersonal question, how do I write, relate with others and with my clients? In order to do this, students have to move through a journey of self-authorship, where they start off at a position of external meaning making, where they still trust external authorities to have the answer, but soon move to a crossroads situation where they question authorities and find tension with, with um, recognised knowledge. This then sets the stage for an internal meaning making process where students find their own voices and make internal commitments. With this knowledge, I moved on to chapter three and asked myself, how successful are we in higher education in facilitating this journey for students towards self-authorship? The research in chapter three was thus about access with success. And this research came at a time where there was exponential growth in student numbers and also the realization of the epistemological gap between secondary and higher education. Both students and lecturers often feel underprepared for the challenges they face. At that stage, the response of the Faculty of the Humanities and the Center of Teaching and Learning was the development of bridging programs, extended programs, and also the academic facilitator sessions. And the aim of these sessions was to find a way to integrate life skills or developmental competencies on the one hand with disciplinary academic outcomes. So with this, we embarked on a mixed methods action research project of five year cycles. And we tried to determine the experiences of students and staff members in an academic program, the various predictors of success, and to find out where the students indeed succeed in integrating competence and content towards an academic identity. So we started off by asking students in their own words to explain academic success. We also considered the vectors of their academic identity development. We looked at their interdependence and their relationships, how they use challenges at, as a motivation for growth, and we also considered the experiences of both flourishing and languishing, and how they move on this continuum between teaching and learning in communities of practice. And from the student's perspective, we've learned the importance of a humanistic or a student-centered approach to learning. Students wanna feel safe and have authentic learning spaces that is embedded in relationships of empathy, unconditional positive regard, and genuineness, as Carl Rogers would have said. Students emphasize that they want to find the heart of learning, to learn to like learning, because this gives them a curiosity for the discipline, the confidence to voice their opinions, and then ultimately also to secure an academic identity. We continued the search and looked at the different predictors of academic success. And we considered factors such as language proficiency. We also looked at time perspective, grade 12 performance, and how this varies for first and continuous generation students, and also at the entry and integration levels of their academic careers. And through all this research, we were humbled by the complexity of predicting academic success. Here is an example of one study where we used regression analysis to try and explain the variance of academic success using a variety of cognitive and non-cognitive factors. And for students in the three-year curriculum, we could ex explain about 18% of the variance in academic success. But when we moved to students in four-year curricula, this decreased to only 2%, which emphasized the importance of considering the variety of constructs that plays a role in student success. 
So this took me to chapter four, when I decided to take one step back to the previous decade of life, the second decade of life, to understand adolescence. The developmental psychologist in me was interested in this so-called identity crisis and how students explore different possible selves and then commit to our understanding of who they are, in addition to the different domains that is salient in their lives. So we set off by exploring aspects such as their risk-taking behavior, future time perspective, we also considered cognitive styles, and self-esteem, and we looked at important domains such as spiritual identity and ethnic identity. And through all of this, what stood out for me was the stories of agency. Adolescents explained to us how they are forging a sense of self through the challenges of their past, their present, and their futures, and how they are deeply aware of their interconnectedness, and especially the sacrifices of their parents and their family members. With this, then, comes the responsibility to pay back. What was interesting is that they defined their re uh, resilience through primarily two aspects. Firstly, the need for having role models. Adolescents emphasized how they really need to look up to grown-ups, to find giants whose shoulders they can stand on. Not only to have these role models, but then also to be role models for others. And equally, or even more importantly, they emphasized education as an essential building block for their future pathways into resilience. This reminded me of what McAdams talked about as redemptive stories. It is these stories that start from negative beginnings and move to positive endings. And in our research, we also found that stories of generativity, of upward mobility, and of liberation. Next, the cultural psychologist in me was interested in adolescence in context. So I was wondering about the contextual factors and the challenges that inform identity development during adolescence. So in we, we investigated this interplay between content and context, and how context is a co-creator of our stories. We considered the role of environmental quality, we looked at parenting style, the role of schools, and also how experiences of being stereotyped, of being living in transitional societies, and being confronted with contrast and contradiction inform our identities. And what I've learned from that is how adolescents are really challenged to stay true to themselves while they are balancing different worlds. On the one hand, they have this need for belonging, and the other hand, the need for individuation, while they're also reconciling where they're coming from and when they are going. This integration of multiple realities is explained by Ferguson in a theory about how we play up and play down certain elements of our identities as we navigate through environments. It is also explained by Nsami Nong as the existential hybridism that many contemporary Africans are confronted with. This complex intermingling of Western and Eastern legacies superimposed on deep-seated African social thought. And Saminang explained this integration of multiple identities and realities like the strands of a braid. So with this, I spiraled back to the third decade of life, emerging adulthood. At the turn of the century in the early 2000s, Geoffrey Arnett remarked that the transition into adulthood is becoming more extended and also more complex, and that a lot of 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds today don't really comply with the traditional norms of adulthood. They are rather at this space of feeling in between, of not being an adolescent anymore, but definitely not being an adult yet. And this started an interesting scholarly debate on whether emerging adulthood is indeed a new developmental stage or if it is something that is applicable only to a minority of Western affluent university students. 
This debate has developed to a place where we realize today that there are many emerging adulthoods, many pathways into adulthood, which has a lot of developmental similarities, but that also differs with regard to culture and social class. So this was the cue for a mixed methods project on South African emerging adults. For the quantitative component, we conducted two large-scale studies with a focus on investigating the extent to which South Africans endorse the dimensions of emerging adulthood. And from a qualitative point of view, we conducted multiple case studies to explore perceptions and experiences of living in South Africa today. We considered aspects such as personality and well-being, the experiences of being an emerging adult parent, and also in-group and out-group orientations. And what we found is a strong endorsement for emerging adulthood, aligned with trends across the world. South African emerging adults strongly identify with these dimensions. What we have seen, however, is interesting nuances with regard to gender, ethnocultural grouping, and generational status, which points to the unique nuances that we find in South Africa and in our context. This can be unpacked through the five pillars of emerging adulthood. In theory, the developmental stage is built on five pillars, and in South Africa today, these pillars are mirrored or reflected in the sense that we are living in a democratic society that is, that is in its third decade of life. It is an emerging adult in, in, in nature. So if we, for instance, look at the first pillar that are feeling in between, we know that young people have that sense of, I'm on the way there, but I'm not there yet. And also in South Africa, in a country that is in transition, people often feel in between, considering changing into group relationships and also the increasing generational gap between previous generations and young people. The second pillar of emerging adulthood is that of possibility. Young people are optimistic and excited about the future. They usually have high hopes and big dreams. And in South Africa, with the democratic transition, there was also talk of a born-free generation and the African Renaissance with the promise of a better life for all. However, the third pillar of emerging adulthood is that of instability. Young people also experience a lot of stress and a lot of uncertainty, and they constantly feel in a state of flux because of changing directions in living arrangements and relationships and careers. And in South Africa, large-scale social change and political transition, which is too fast for some and too slow for others, also cause this sense of uncertainty. The fourth pillar of emerging adulthood is an interesting one, and that is the fact that young people are relatively free from demands, from work demands and family obligations. And while some emerging adult scholars, which will call this a healthy self-focus, Others are wondering if this means a selfishness or an entitlement. And in our research in South Africa, we've seen a definite balance between a self-focus and the other focus. In our participants emphasizing their ties with family roles and responsibilities and also interconnectedness and spirituality. The last pillar, that of exploring our identities and our roles and our worldviews is mirrored in South Africa in a country that is searching for a post-apartheid identity. And the young people in South Africa thus have to discover themselves by considering notions of diversity and inequality on the one hand versus the need to find some common ground on the other. So this interplay, this mirroring between human development and societal change brings me to my current chapter, where I'm interested um, in the narratives at this intersection between self and society. We've seen in the pre presentation up to now how the self unfolds through different layers. In theory, they talk about the actor, the agent, and the author. And South African emerging adults are doing just that. They are acting in a social world filled with complexity and transition, but also act as agents as they advance through low points, turning points, and high points to tell redemptive stories of purpose and meaning. 
Thirdly, there are also authors reconstructing their present, their uh, past, and their future into a coherent life story and a narrative identity. In contemporary society, this often, happen, often happens on social media, which has become like a super peer for socialization. Social media is a space where we can have this conversation between personal narratives and master narratives, societal narratives. And as social media users, emerging adults do this. They act in a social world that is blurred between the digital and the physical. They author real and ideal and sometimes false aspects of themselves to diverse audiences. And through all of this, they show an agency. They actively and intentionally choose these social media engagements in a way to protect their positivity in a world filled with uncertainty. In an interesting turn in my research, we've also looked at tattoos and how tattoos can be a way in which people express their narrative identities as a way to ink their pasts, but also to do personal branding and as a way to journal the stories of their lives. My last chapter is The Way Forward. Through all the research I've done, I've become convinced about South Africa and the global self's um, ability to contribute to global knowledge production. And I'm looking forward to add a South African voice to many multicultural, multinational projects that we are currently embarking on. We are focusing with various other countries on aspects around positive youth development, social inequality, the minority-majority juxtaposition, and also the intricacies of finding quality in life. In moving forward, it is important to move from a received Euro-Western discourse to a more authentic and situated discourse in Africa. Majority world contexts, such as Africa, and African-centered worldviews have a lot of richness to offer and can provide novel insights to help us to understand the unfolding complexity of the world. We've recently on, embarked on a study with colleagues from Switzerland, which is called the African Long Life Study. And this study is situated in Africa, currently in South Africa, Namibia, and Kenya, and next year also hopefully in Ghana and Nigeria. And we are following the lives of a thousand young adults in each country, trying to understand their lived experiences and their psychological development from an African-centered critical psychology point of view. I've also realized the need to move beyond academically defined disciplinary paradigms. If we really want to appreciate the complexity of the human experience and of an interrelated world, we need interdisciplinary research. So with the support of a grant from the Vice Rector's Office, we've recently embarked on a project at the University of the Free State called Selves Within Selves, where we're exploring the intersectionality of student identity in a transitional society. And finally, my vision is the establishment of an identity research hub at the University of the Free State to establish a center for self and society in the Faculty of the Humanities where we can consolidate all these research activities and formalize interdisciplinary partnerships. Hopefully this can inspire new research projects and also attract future postgraduate students. And it can provide fertile ground where we can train research field workers through accredited short courses and also to mentor the scholars of the future. I conclude with a quote that inspires me to continue the research journey, and that is that in times of change, the learners will inherit the world, while the learned will find themselves beautifully equipped to understand a world that no longer exists. I thank you. Members of the Rectorate, Professor Wittun, Dr. Kubela. Members of the Deanery, Professor, Witt, uh, uh, Professor Hudson, Professor Twala. Uh, esteemed colleagues, 
um, members, family members, Yuan. It gives me great pleasure to thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, I was sitting and listening to your, to your lecture, uh, Luzel, and what a fascinating journey in terms of development and scholarship uh, it was not. And um, you, you ended on, on such a positive note in terms of the way forward in what you envisage uh, as well. Um, I think as HOD of the department, I stand here with great pride. I, Professor Vatun, you mentioned two inaugural lectures, but this was actually three. Um, and it's a, it's a sign in terms of where our department is. And as we come to the end of this inaugural lecture series as well, uh, we know that we stand in good st uh, step in the department as well, and we will continue in terms of going forward uh, as well. So congratulations with your inaugural lecture in this momentous occasion as well, Luzel. Um, members of, of the audience uh, as the, depart the department, and also on behalf of uh, Professor Nudir, uh, we would like to invite you for some refreshments that will be served within the foyer. We will just ask you to just remain seated for a, for a moment or two, just to give uh, uh, Luzel, Professor Nodia, and Johan just an opportunity to take their, their places there in, uh, at the door uh, for us just to congratulate them. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance here tonight. <laughs>